بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد ومبارك وسلم first i want to tell you that this is perhaps the most dense presentation because the history of the compilation of hadith is one of the most detailed and most complicated aspects of the intellectual tradition of islam so much so that once we we're part of an entire semester course on this topic and you couldn't do an entire degree on this topic what I'm about to do for you. So if any, and I keep saying this to you, but if any time it was the most true is what I'm about to do for you today, it's a drop in the ocean. What I will try to do is highlight some of the misconceptions that people have and try to correct them. And I will try to give you a small glimpse of what goes on in the Islamic scholar tradition when it comes to hadith. Now, just to give you an idea, I'm going to give you a small menu and see how many of these things we can do. First set, first major area to discuss is why do you even need hadith in the first place? Because there is a segment of people who believe that there is nothing you need other than the Quran. Alright? Now, that segment is few and far between, but I have to do that first. But if I do that in too much detail, then you won't be able to get to the heat of it. So first misconception that you only need Qur'an. Second, it's the second group that says, no, I accept hadith, but I only accept those hadith that don't contradict the Qur'an. So again, you have to unpack this statement. It means that I don't accept those hadith that the interpretation and the understanding of that hadith that comes to my akal is against the understanding of that verse that comes to my akal. They cannot make this declaration. Nobody can make that declaration that this hadith definitively goes against this verse of Qur'an. The most anybody can say is, my understanding of this hadith goes under against my understanding of this verse of Qur'an. So for example, if Javed Ahmed Ghamdi Sahib says this, which he says very frequently, and I told you his concept of hadith is this, that we will only accept those hadith that do not contradict Qur'an, actually what he's saying is that Ghamdi Sahib's interpretation of this hadith goes against Ghamdi Sahib's interpretation of this verse of Qur'an. Therefore, Ghamdi Sahib does not accept this hadith. Alright? You must flush out what people are saying and understand that. His view is not binding on us. Alright? Now, you will have a choice. Ghamdi Sahib's interpretation of this hadith goes against Ghamdi Sahib's interpretation of this verse. And the entire 1200 years, entire scholar tradition of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah understanding of the hadith is perfectly compatible with their understanding of Quran. So it's up to you what type of understanding you want to take. If you want to take that understanding which suggests there's contradiction between hadith and Quran, between authentic hadith and Quran, you will have to answer a whole lot of questions when I flush out the logical implications and consequences of such a stance. Third position, third misconception, is that I will only accept Quran and Sahih Hadith. That's actually wrong also. You might be stunned to hear this because again, now unfortunately for me, this is a one minute issue because we've seen the tradition. No muhaddith in the history of Islam, no single, it's a challenge and you can take it back to the people who tell you this. No single muhaddith has ever written or argued or suggested this that the only hadith that are hadith are Sahih Hadith. So this is entirely against the concept of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. I'm going to show you that. That may we have to spend the most time on. So within that there are levels of misconception. First is I will only accept Quran and the Hadith that are in Sahih, Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Second is I will only accept Quran and the Sahih Hadith that are in Bukhari and Muslim and the Sahih Hadith of the other four collections as decided by Nasruddin al-Bani. Third level of, third Possible misconception, I will accept Qur'an, the Sahih Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the Sahih Hadith in those four collections, and any Sahih Hadith found outside those remaining six collections. No. Then the last possibility is the understanding of the entire Muhaddithin tradition. Not Hanafi, not only Maliki, not only Indian, not only Egyptian, not only Deobandi, not only Syrian. The entire single Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, Indonesian, Malaysian, Indian, Turkish, Central Asian, Uzbek, Arab, Egyptian, Syrian, Iraqi, Jordanian, Moroccan. The entire, entire history of the Ahl-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah scholar. The entire tradition, what? That I accept the Qur'an. 
and accept all the hadith that the muhaddithin have accepted. The hadith that the muhaddithin label as sahih, I will accept it as sahih. The hadith that the muhaddithin label as hasan, I will accept it as hasan. And the hadith that the muhaddithin label as zayf, as weak, but nonetheless they are hadith, as opposed to mawdu'ah, which is a forged fabrication, I will also accept that my Prophet Sallallahu did say this, and it is part of his sunnah, and it is guidance and meaning for me, with the understanding that this guidance and meaning and sunnah has reached me through a chain, which has a single weak narrator, as the Muhaddithin tagged it and labeled it for me. And with the understanding that given that it has that tag, the level of meaning in it is slightly qualified and needs to be looked at, which I'm going to show you, as opposed to a sahi and hasan hadith, which I will take without any qualification whatsoever. But I 100% accept it as hadith, and I accept it as part of sunnah, and I accept it part of my hidayah, and every single muhaddith, including Imam Bukhari, by the way, narrated and taught zayf hadith, and viewed zayf hadith to be part of the sunnah. That school of thought, it's irrespective, they call themselves Salafi or al hadith it doesn't matter. Any school of thought which suggests that Zayf hadith are not part of the sunnah, they're guilty of tahrif fil sunnah. Like tahrif fil kitab means to take something out of the Quran, they're guilty of nothing less than tahrif fil sunnah when they try to convince you don't read it, don't be guided by it, don't accept its meanings. So such populist speakers on the circuit they will tell you such things that don't read Zayf for these. Actually, the senior true scholars who are of a Salafi ideology, no doubt, but they're true scholars. They will never tell you that. Never. It's not possible. I'll give you some names, but they don't write or speak in English nor Urdu, right? Uh, for example, uh, Sheikh Sharif al Awni, as one example, right? Al Hatim al Sharif al Awni, he's one of the most senior scholars in Saudi Arabia today. He will never take this position that there's no such thing as Zayf Hadith, all Zayf aren't Hadith, you can't use them for anything. No, right? There is a difference in, like I told you, in the, amongst the scholars. The difference between the Salafi and the classical Sunni position is how much of a reservation you will have on using the Zayf Hadith. That's the only difference. They don't cast it out. They don't say it's not Hadith. The scholars, they don't say it's not Sunnah. The popular speakers will talk like that. The Saudi, Salafi, well-trained, deep, reflective, pious, muttaqi, salihim, dhakreen, wali scholars. Understand, spirituality is something different. Don't think that uh, the Salafi, Dilbandi, anything else is going to go to Jannah based on their taqwa and wilaya. Unfortunately, although some people think like that, Jannah will neither be all Dilbandi nor will it be all Salafi. It's not like that. You're all going to get along just fine if you make it there, inshallah. Alright? But in this world, in this world, there is a difference in the scholarly position taken. But the difference again, so lest you be mistaken, it's not Saudi versus India. It's not Arab versus Pakistani. It's the entire, and up till today, I don't have to say 1200 years, 1400 years of mainstream majority Sunni scholarship from a wide range of ethnicities and races and backgrounds, including Arabs, and Saudis, and also other nationalities, because they're obviously Pakistanis and Indians, and Saudi and Saudi-inspired people and other nationalities who are Salafis and Aladis, which is maybe 10-15% of the Sunni world. All right? So there will be a difference in the scholars of these two camps and how much of a reservation you should have on the use of Zayif Hadith. All right? The difference, again, is not between Saudi and Pakistani, not between Salafi and Hanafi. The difference is between contemporary Salafi scholars, be they Saudi or Pakistani or something else, and the entire tradition, not just the Ubanis or Hanafis, the entire tradition, difference with Imam Shafi, difference with Imam Malik, difference with Moroccan Hadith scholars, difference with Syrian Hadith scholars. All right? So you have to frame the debate carefully. That will be a difference that I will show you. All right? So these are the levels. No Hadith at all. Only those Hadith and Sahih Bukhari Muslim, only those Hadith that according to my akal or according to Quran. And I don't look at authenticity, I look at my akal to decide whether I accept the hadith. Third is, I accept hadith that are declared as sahih, but only if they're in Bukhari Muslim. 
Fourth, was I accept hadith that are declared in Sahih only if the Bukhari Muslim or Albani has declared them to be Sahih and the other four collections of Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, and Asai ibn Majah. Next is I accept though all of the above plus any hadith Sahih that is outside. Next is, which the Salafi scholars are also on this, that I accept all the hadith that the early Muhaddisin accepted, including Hassan and Zayf. Here it splits off. How much is my reservation on the use of Zayf hadith, and what is it, and what's my basis for it? All right, so this is the whole thing to look at. And this is impossible to do in four hours. And therefore it's absolutely impossible to do in two hours. And therefore it is triply impossible to do in one and a half hours however much time you want to stay. Here, very quickly, I'm going to answer the first issue, that is there even such a concept of hadith and a concept of sunnah? Can't you just read the Qur'an? Now, common arguments, you will, for example, these people called themselves Ahlul Qur'an. It was a major movement in Indian Pakistan. There was a person here by the name of Ghulam Ahmad Parvez. He very, very insistently spread this view, and he had a lot of followers. In fact, almost all of his followers were in the quote-unquote educated class, Right? Yet another proof, by the way, in contemporary times in history, that educated people make a lot of mistakes when it comes to the. <laughs> yes, if I was to do that presentation for you, that could all I could also do that till Fajr. <laughs> so don't think that being educated means you cannot make mistakes in Deen. The history of Deen is full of educated people who made horrific mistakes in their Deen, whether in understanding their Deen or in practice of Deen. That's called sin. That's called sin, and that's the easy way to tell you. Your ed- just like your education can't stop you from a spiritual error, your education in something other than Islamic knowledge can't stop you from an intellectual error. All right? Okay. But I want to get this out of the way because maybe you interact with such people who deny the authenticity of Hadith altogether. Or if anything, you need to have a more robust understanding. So obviously if you're engaging such a person, you can only argue from Quran. Right? Whenever you're engaging a person, and by the way, engaging is not to make them feel bad, you're inviting them. Remember, you're yearning for them. Your heart should be yearning and missing all those wonderful Muslims who for some reason fell in this deception that there's no such thing as hadith. You should be loving them, yearning them, missing them, wanting them to know Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he is revealed in the sunnah. And they're not, they've folded up, <laughs> they've folded up that beautiful carpet and tapestry. All right? But obviously now when you talk to someone, you have to talk to them on agreed principles. So what can you do with a person who's from Ahl Quran? Show them Quran. <laughs> Show them Quran. No problem. We say, okay, you accept Quran, we accept Quran. Bismillah. Here's a presentation on Quran. All right? Now, you, I'm going to verbally translate this for you, but this again is the thing, is one of the things that you will get. Okay, I'll do Billah And I'm going to go a little bit fast in Arabic, but I'll explain the English to you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد من الله المؤمنين إذ بأث فيهم رسولا من أنفسهم ليتو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويؤلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ذلال مبين Indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his special grace and favor on the believers when he sent to them from their own midst a messenger to do what? Number one يتلو عليهم آياته to recite to them the verses of Quran but there's more. And second, will you zakki him? And to purify them. And third, will you allimuhum al kitaba? And to teach them the knowledge of that recited scripture. Well, hikmah, and to teach them wisdom. When kanu min kabul and prior to that you were in manifest error and you were astray. So this is this verse in Quran, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the four functions of prophethood. In other words, the person who was from Ahl Quran, you ask them, okay, who is Rasulullah sallallahu What is it a prophet? So he says the prophet is nothing other than simply the agent of revelation. Actually, what we believe about Jibreel alayhi salam, basically they believe that about Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So okay, let's look in Quran. Allah Ta'ala has the right to tell us. Allah Ta'ala is going to tell us what will Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa do. Yatu alayhim ayati yes. Recite the verses of revelation. If the verse stopped here, the Ahl Quran would have a basis to use this verse as their, an argument for their position. But that's clearly not enough. The prophetic role is more. Now understand our necessary aqidah about Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Our aqidah is that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-khatum al nabiyin the last and final messenger and prophet in every sense, and that his nubuwa is kamil and mukammal. But because he's last, 
his prophethood and prophetic teachings must be kamil and mukammal. He must perfectly have transmitted perfectly and completely done all of the things that Allah Ta'ala told him to do in Quran and those teachings must remain perfect and complete in order for Hidayah to continue. Otherwise he's just a Nabi for the Sahaba, right? He won't be a Nabi for me and you if there were things that he did for them and me and you don't have access for that. Things that are a part of our Hidayah, right? So the second aspect of his Nabuwa, sorry, that our aspect of his Nabuwa, the second thing in his Nabuwa is what you him. And he purified the Sahaba Ikram and aligned their hearts and personalities with taqwa, sunnah, haya, zikr, tawakkul, sabr, shukr. This was part of his prophetic mission and part of his prophetic teachings. Though that mission and those teachings must continue till today for us to still be in the age of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as perfect and completely intact the Quran is, the recited scripture, as equally, it's equally part of his nabuwa, wa yuzakkihim. So equally perfect and complete and intact must remain the mission and teachings of Tazkiyah all the way till the end of time. And then wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab. These are the talimat of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The prophetic explanations and teachings. And I already explained this yesterday. It doesn't mean that Sayyidina Rasulullah commented on a particular verse. It's his topics. Every hadith he spoke was about a topic of deen and that topic is found in Qur'an. So the entire sunnah is talim of Qur'an. And Nabi Karim Sassam must necessarily have followed Allah Ta'ala's instruction that you are supposed to do talim, you are supposed to teach, and those teachings must remain perfect and completely intact until the end, as long as the ummah is alive. So where are you going to find those teachings? It's not in Quran. That's what's called the hadith and the sunnah. So the Quran is pointing to a set of teachings. Then if they said that no, the teachings means just teaching the Quran itself. Well, hikmah, to Allah Ta'ala means another word, that you're going to give them talimat and the kitab and something additional. You will also, part of your nabuwa, part of the nabuwa of the Prophet Wasallam is to teach things in addition to the Quran. Now those teachings have to be there for us in order for this religion to still be valid and to exist on earth. So this verse clearly points to extra Quranic prophetic teachings and defeats what one author has called the Nauzabillah parrot theory of prophethood that Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam is only going to listen and parrot what Jibreel Islam said. He has no other function. He just has to repeat what Angel Jibreel said to him. But that's what the Ahl Quran and Pervezi position believes in. Oh, okay, next. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَكُلَّ اللَّهُ وَالرَّسُولَ That you must obey Allah ta'ala and obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ And if you turn away from this obedience to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah ta'ala does not love the people who don't deny and don't believe. So obedience to Allah ta'ala and obedience to Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are part of Iman. Obedience to Allah, Qur'an, and obedience to Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's in his mm, sunnah hadith. Here again Allah Ta'ala mentions the same thing in the sight. Different way to Allah wa Rasulullah, alakum turhamun. You must obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that the mercy of Allah Ta'ala may overwhelm and envelop you. Alright. Sometimes you will get a response from them that look at this verb ati'u is obey Allah. And the Prophet just means that obey Him in His delivery of the revelatory message to you. So perhaps, Allah Alam, because we cannot claim, nobody can claim to know Allah Ta'ala's motives, but perhaps anticipating this, in another verse, Allah Ta'ala made it clear, wa to make it clear that these are two separate forms of obedience, Allah Ta'ala flushed it out and said the thing separate. Set the verb separate. And obey Allah Ta'ala and obey Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now bring in linguistic analysis. Wow, this is a particle or preposition in Arabic. It means and. When you look up in Arabic grammar, even from the Christians who write about Arabic grammar, is wow comes from what we call mughayra. Mughayra means that for what is before the wow is ghair to what is something after the wow. 
Wow comes for distinction and differentiation. Means the obedience to Allah Ta'ala is a one thing, wa ati'u rasul is something else. They're ghair ghair to each other. So obey and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a separate, distinct, differentiated thing, obey Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are two separate things. That to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Quran, to obey Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is in the sunnah and hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All right. Khair, the same thing then at the end of Alamu Annama Allah Rasulun al Balagh al Mubin that on the Prophet Sallam is just to present and deliver to you these teachings. Alright. Ya Yu Ladina Manuti Allah wa Rasuluhu wa Lata Wallo and Huwa Antum Tasmaun. That all you believe obey Allah Ta'ala and his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and do not turn away from him. This is now important thing. This here, if you're looking who Walata wallu anhuma would be don't turn away from both of them, Allah Ta'ala and the Messenger. But here is the singular for those of you in Arabic. Walata wallu anhu. And the pronoun always refers back to the closest proper noun. So the translation will be and don't turn away from the obedience of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa antum tasma'un, even though you were listening and hearing his words. Means hadith. <laughs> Means hadith. This also gives you the proof of the oral tradition of hadith. Hadith was transmitted orally by Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's also coming later. Okay, the same thing, it's coming twice. Obey Allah subhanahu and obey the Prophet sallallahu That okay. Alayhi. If they turn away, then on him is what is on his duty, وَعَلَيْكُمْ مَا humiltum, And upon you what is your duty, means Nabi Akhlim was responsible to say those hadiths to you, and what you were responsible was to listen and obey. Alright? He did his duty, you have to do your duty. Now look, وَإِن تُطِيُوهُ And if you were to obey him, again this is singular, it's not what in to the uhuma if you were obeyed to the two of them, Allah Ta'ala and Prophet. And again here who this is I'm doing Surah Nur verses fifty four, that the pronoun goes back to Sayyidina Rasulullah he says something. If you were to obey him, tahtadu, then you would be rightly guided. So being rightly guided is based on obedience to Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Next verse. Ya Lina Amrati Allah wa Tiwa Rasulullah wala tubtulu a malukum. Obey Allah Ta'ala and obey the Prophet Sallallahu and do not render null and void and false your actions when you disobey either one of them. Disobey either one of them. Okay, now look at another now set of verses. They don't have the word itat and it necessarily a couple do, but another way to look at it. Tilka hadudullah that these are the boundaries set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا يُتِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُونَ هُمْ سَرْفَ بَيْزَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى مَسَنْجِرُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَمْ يُدْخِلْهُ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْحَادِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا That they will, be made, they will be entered into gardens underneath which underneath which rivers and streams flow, and they will dwell therein forever. وَذَلَكَ الْفَوْزُ الْأَذِيمِ This is the tremendous success, again based on obedience to both. Again, obedience here is mentioned to both. And we have never ever sent any messenger except that they should be obeyed with the izn of Allah Ta'ala. Right? Now if obedience to the Prophet was just following Quran, that wouldn't be called izn. It means Allah Ta'ala saying, I'm sending the Prophet in the legislative lawmaker capacity to you, and because I sent him to you with my izin, with my will and wish and permission, you have to obey what he tells you to do. Now, next set of verses are going to make it even more outright explicit. Number one, this is Surah Nasa, verse 80. May Rasulah faqad ata Allah. Whomsoever obeys the Prophet ﷺ, it's equivalent to and tantamount and as if they obeyed Allah. This is something else. وَمَنْ يُتِئِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَى Allah. This is clear obedience, authority of the hadith and the sunnah. And Allah Ta'ala is giving it such an authority, He's equ- equating it and making it tantamount to obeying Him. Now watch this. 
وَمَاكَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَ And it does not befit any male believer nor female believer. إِذَا قَدَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ If Allah Ta'ala decides and His Messenger Sallallahu decide Amr on any matter, أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمَ الْخِيَرَ There's no way they have any choice left min amrihim in that matter anymore. When Allah Ta'ala decided, it's finished. There's no choice left. This is also interesting. You have no ikhtiyar. You have no khiyar, no ikhtiyar. وَمَنْ يَعْسِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And whom Muslim disobeys Allah Ta'ala and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam فَكَذْ ذَلَّ ذَلَالَ مُبِينَا And they've gone astray in a wide way. Alright, then Nabi Akrim Allah Ta'ala said in Quran about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قُلْ إِن كُنْتَمْ تِهُمْبُونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِئُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمَ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غُفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Oh, proclaim to them, my beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, O oh, people, if you claim that you love Allah Ta'ala, you must to ittiba of me. Fattibi'uni, you must follow me. A person says, I love Allah Ta'ala, I follow Quran. Allah Ta'ala says, Kul, tell them, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, that if you claim to love Allah Ta'ala, tell them that they better follow you. <laughs> There's only one path to Allah, it's called the sunnah. Allah Ta'ala is not the name of that being that you approach Him on your terms. Allah Ta'ala is the name of that being, you approach Him on His terms. That's the might and majesty of Allah Ta'ala. And you approach Him on His terms, what are His terms? His terms is called the sunnah of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's His terms. You can't love Allah Ta'ala your own way. It's also an answer to some Mars. Now I have my own way of loving Allah Ta'ala. Allah said, "In kuntum tuhibun Allah, if you claim you love Allah Taala, fattabi'uni, bring it to by sunnah. There is no other way of loving Allah Taala. There is no other ma'na meaning to loving Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. This is Quran. What will happen then? You will Allah will love you. You habibkum Allah. Allah will love you. Wa yaghfir lakum dunubukum, and He will forgive you for all of your sins. This is the power of sunnah. This is the rank of sunnah." Sunnah equals mahbubiya. Whenever you follow the sunnah, you become beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. More sunnah, more mahbub, less sunnah, less mahbub. That's what Allah is saying in the Quran. More sunnah, more mahbub, less sunnah, less mahbub. I mean, now it's up to you. Everybody has a choice. You want to be mahbub? You want to be less mahbub? You want to be more mahbub? You want jannah? You want jannah to pradoz? You want Jannah without Hisab, you want Jannah with Hisab, you want Jannah without going to Jahannam, you want Jannah even after going to Jahannam, all of this is there. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> it's all up to you. What's one way if a person says, look, I just give me something simple. I want Jannah to Firdaus Bighayri Hisab. Give me something simple. I want to be most Mahbub. I give you this ayah. I give you one word, Fattabi'uni. One word. You want it up front, plain and simple? You say, this is too fancy intellectual stuff for me. See this about Quran. Huh? Give me one word. Fattabi'uni. Allah Ta'ala gave you one word. Ittiba'i sunnah. Allahu Akbar Kabira. This is Sha'an. Sha'an Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, now look. What does, now, Allah Ta'ala is telling, in this next verse, so, uh, Top verse, verse 158. Allah Ta'ala is telling Nabi Karim Sallallahu how should you introduce yourself? Qul, proclaim to them, speak to them in the following way, my beloved messenger Sallallahu Alaihi say what to them? Ya ayuhan nas, address all of them. They said, we left the nas once, I showed you the insan once, it's all humanity. He's Nabi of insan. Tell them, all, oh, each and every person, inni rasulullahi ilaykum jami'a. I'm the prophet and messenger to all of you entirely. It's finished now. Hmm? Oh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Kaliani comes and says, I'm your prophet. He said, no, no. My Allah told me in Quran that Sayyidina Rasulullah, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is prophet to who? Ilaykum jami'a. To all of humanity. It's finished. This is also an ayah of Khatam and Nabuat. Remember, you can't look for word for word all the time. It's their Khatam and Nabin. They try to play with you the word on Khatam. <laughs> So you take this ayah then. So okay, you want to seal the Quran, do Quran. What does it mean to be the seal of prophethood? To be the finality of prophethood? To be the last prophet? It means that Nabi inni Rasulullahi alaykum jami'a. Is the Quran forever? If the Quran is forever, this statement is forever. 
Is the Quran for all time? This statement is for all time? We don't accept any Nabi and we can never do it. His name be Masailama, his name may be Qadiani, his name may be Mirza. We can never accept it. Never. Never. Which one? Allah samawati wal arunda. I'm the messenger of who is that Allah Ta'ala I'm the messenger of? That Allah Ta'ala to whom belongs the dominion, sovereignty, power on all the heavenly realms and the earthly existence. La ilaha illahu. That there is no being except him who you who you meet, he brings to life, he brings to death. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ النَّبِيِّ الْأُمِّيِّ الَّذِي يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَكَلِمَاتِهِ So therefore you believe in Allah Ta'ala and the messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, which messenger who is the prophet, who is unlettered, the one الَّذِي يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ The one who himself believes in Allah. That's a beautiful way. Nabi Allah Ta'ala is telling the Prophet, talk to them like this. Why should I believe in your sunnah? Why should I believe in your hadith? Because I myself, the, 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 the Prophet, I himself believe in Allah Ta'ala. Hmm? I'm his Nabi, which means Naba. Do you remember? Na'an-Nab al-Azim, Nabiyun, even the Arabic meaning, like Alimun, Nabi, Nabiyun means that being who gets a lot of information from Allah Ta'ala. Like Alimun is that being with a lot of ilm. Naba means information. The word Nabi, Nabiyun means Allah Ta'ala, Nabi, Sayyidina Rasulullah SAW gets a lot of information from Allah Ta'ala. Revelation, prophethood. Why? Hmm? I believe in Allah Ta'ala and all of His sacred scriptures. Then, look. Wattabi'uhu. Do ittiba of Him. Do ittiba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. La'allakum tahtadun. So that you may be rightly guided. Alright. Even the earlier people. What? They used to make dua. So even the uh, when people accepted Iman, they would make dua, Rabbana amanna bima unzalta. That, oh Allah, we take Iman in that which you revealed. Wattaba'na rasula. And we do ittaba'a rasul. These are two separate things. We believe in the revealed scripture, Quran, and, wa and, wattaba'na rasula. And we follow the Prophet ﷺ because we do these things, Quran and Sunnah, faktubna ma shahideen. Let us write our name in the rings of those people who have bore witness to you. Alright? Okay. وَكَذَلَكَ جَأَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى That indeed Allah says, thus thereby we made you the... Because I have such an aversion to the word moderate, because it's been used from properly. We have made you the community of propriety. We have made you the computer community of true equilibrium and balance. Hmm? Of perfect fairness and equity. Alright? لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ So that you, which ummah is this? Is this talking about ummah Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Or is this talking about ummah Mirza? Hmm? This is talking about ummah Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the last and final ummah. Last and final Quran, last and final script book, last and final prophet, last and final deen, and last and final ummah. That's also proof of Khatam in Abut. And this ummah is going to be what? لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى nas That you will bear witnesses on all of the people to come. So there's no need for any other ummah. <laughs> there's no other ummah, there's no other nabi. This ummah is going to bear witness to Allah Ta'ala's existence and to Sayyidina Rasulullah of Nabuwa and share that iman with all people for all time to come. لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِدًا And Sayyidina Rasulullah Islam, He will be witness to you that you are His Ummah. Now who do you want? You want to take this ad Rasul to mean the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You want to take this to know Mirza will bear witness to me on the Day of Judgment. Hmm? It's a serious thing. I'm driving this home to you. Why? Because there's another secular liberal myth that anyone and everyone who wants to call themselves Muslim, I should let them call themselves Muslim. Even if they say, I believe in another prophet, no problem, I'm liberal, I'm tolerant. No. I've explained this in a separate venue. Yes, our liberalism and tolerance is this. We have no violence against you. We have no persecution against you. We can work with you as colleagues. We can learn with you in the same educational institutions. You can be a professor of physics to our students. No problem. But we can't call you Muslim because you've chosen to accept another prophet. But we draw the line. (laughs) If somebody says that 
if my brother says I accept somebody else as my father, so you're not my brother anymore. <laughs> you, you can't be my brother now. <laughs> you can't be my brother. <laughs> All right? There, there's no need for any other Nabi in any way. That suggests there's a nuqs in the Nabu of Nabi Akareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All right? Okay? But it doesn't mean, so don't misquote me or take me out of context like many, nine, so many times people do in Pakistan. In fact, this course is probably the most misquotable thing I've ever taught in my life. The amount of one-liners you could pluck out and misrepresent and misquote me is phenomenal in this five-day series. <laughs> yeah. All right? All right. Understand, I'm trying to show you Khatm al is a very serious aqidah. It's deep. You shouldn't shy away from it. You should embrace the iman and the finality of the Prophet ﷺ while being able to peacefully, mutually coexist with anybody who denies that. Maybe they deny all Prophet or they're an atheist. Maybe they deny the finality of the Prophet or they believe in ten Prophets after him. It's no problem. You want to be a peaceful citizen of Pakistan and we live with you. We have no problem with that. We just have one thing. You can't call yourself Muslim. That's it. You can't take our name for your religion. You create your own religion, give it your own name. No problem. That's your choice. All right? All right. وَمَا جَأَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا إِلَّا لَنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يَتَّبِعُ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ مَنْ يَنْكَلِبُ عَلَىٰ أَقِبَيْهِ This is when Allah changed the Qibla, because there was a mount in that also, from Beitul Muqaddis to Makkah Mukarma to Kaaba. Right? And it's saying, we did this to test who really follows you and who doesn't. So what was the, what Allah Ta'ala tests this. Ittibai Rasul is tested by Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. لَكَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Indeed you have in you and the blessed messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a noble, perfect, virtuous, ideal, exemplar. But not everybody will view the sunnah. Now question, why do some Muslims not follow sunnah? Answer is in this verse. Who is going to find the sunnah hasana? Who is going to find his appearance beautiful? Who is going to find his manner of eating beautiful? Who is going to find his attributes beautiful? Who is going to find his adab akhlaq beautiful? Not everyone. A particular type of believer. Which one? لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ that person who really, really longs and yearns for Allah Ta'ala. Wala yawm al They long for the Day of Judgment. They're not scared of Day of Judgment. They want it. <laughs> they want it to happen now. Allah Akbar. Alright. May Allah Ta'ala make us have iman. Why? Because they know that's the day I get to meet Allah Ta'ala. That's the day I'll see Rasulullah Wasallam. This is their hope. <laughs> so they want it. And what's their other character? Characteristic, وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا That's why our mashayikh, they teach us zikr. You make more zikr, you will follow more sunnah. Why? Because the more zikr you make, the more your heart will feel attraction towards the sunnah. The more zikr you make, the more beautiful you will find the sunnah. That's where you'll find classically the people of zikr, they follow the most sunnah. Because it's Qur'an. It's in Qur'an. Who views sunnah as beautiful? ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا That person who makes abundant zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright? Alright. Now, I'm getting worried. Right? You see how deep this Qur'an is, but how I don't know how to trim these presentations for you. Right? How do I decide which ayah not to show you? Allah <laughs> Akbar. Huh? But it's difficult for us. There's no ayah that you don't know. Hmm? What can I do? Alright? Here just a couple more, don't worry. We're second to last page. Hafizu ala salawati wa salatil wusta. This is also, by the way, some people say the five prayers aren't mentioned in the Quran. In the Arabic grammar, salah is singular. Salatain is dual. Salawat is plural, means at least three. At least three are included in the plural. So, steadfastly guard and preserve the multiple prayers. And, Salatul Wusta. Some say it's Asr, some say it's Fajr. So three plus one, at least four are mentioned here. This, that's another presentation. There's other places in Quran where Allah Ta'ala has mentioned Salah. You can come up with the five prayers from the Quran. Reason is because the Pravesis, they don't pray either. They say there's no such thing as prayer. There's no such thing. I mean, what do they do with this verse? <laughs> right? 
and you must stand in front of Allah Ta'ala in awe and reverence and fear and longing for Him. فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ So if you are in fear, this is in jihad, that you're in fear that if I take the time out to pray, my enemy might kill me. فَرِدَالًا or رُكْبَانًا So you may either pray walking or while riding on your mount. فَإِذَا أَمِنْتُمْ And then when you again become in safety, security, you know you can pray without any threat, you're in a state of aman. فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ Now watch, this is very important. This is a very critical verse. فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ كَمَا أَلَّمَكُمْ Remember, Allah Ta'ala means there's one way of praying while walking and riding. But when you're in peace, pray. Remember, Allah Ta'ala means pray. كَمَا أَلَّمَكُمْ How Allah Ta'ala taught you. Allah Ta'ala is not taught in Salah in Quran how to pray. Allah Ta'ala taught the Prophet Sallallahu how to pray and He taught us. Means every single thing the Prophet Sallallahu taught us, which is in Hadith, all of that is what Allah Ta'ala taught him. Kama Allamakum. As Allah Ta'ala taught you, Malam Tukunu Ta'lamun. And you never knew that before. And yes, that's true. They didn't, Sahaba did not know how to pray. Until Allah Ta'ala taught them. But how did Allah Ta'ala teach them? Not in Quran. Can you find me in Quran where it says that how to make ruku and to say Subhan Rabbi three times? It's not in Quran. To say Subhan Rabbi Allah and Sajda, how many Sajdas to make, how many Rakahs to pray. This is on Hadith. But all of that knowledge is Allah Ta'ala's teaching it. And He's referring to it in Quran. Referring to the method of prayer as being taught by Allah Ta'ala in Quran. So this is proof that this body of knowledge extra Quranic knowledge called Sunnah and Hadith that exists. Alright? لَا تُحَرِّكْ بِهِ لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ Allah told the Prophet that you don't have to hurry your tongue. Right? Don't, rapid, don't rapidly move your tongue to hurry, to hasten the recitation. إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمْعُهُ Allah is saying it is in my, it is me and all my might, splendor and majesty who will take care of its gathering. وَقُرْآنَهُ and its recitation Quran. So when it's recited, follow the recitation. Thumma inna alayna bayanahu. So then Allah Ta'ala said, and upon me is to explain it. So just like the Prophet received the kirat of Quran, the Quran was recited to him, believe me, bayan al Quran, the Quran was also explained by Allah Ta'ala to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just like the Prophet shared what was recited to him by reciting it, yet to alayhim, Quran, he also shared as part of his nabu with the ummah what was explained to him by explaining it, hadith and sunnah. So this bayan, that's called the hadith and sunnah. وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَأَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمُ تَعْلَمُ and Allah Ta'ala sent down upon you, Prophet Sallallahu the scripture and wisdom. So there's more that was received. And that more that was taught is called the sunnah. وَأَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمُ And Allah Ta'ala taught you what you didn't know. وَكَانَ فَضَلَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ أَذِيمًا Indeed, Allah Ta'ala has done tremendous grace and bounty on you. Now the last verse, which is absolutely explicit. So, this is for your knowledge, but if you want just to say one, you can quote this one. وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ أَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever the Prophet, whatever comes, whatever the Prophet brings to you, means tells you, فَخُذُهُ Grab onto it. وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ And what he tells you, not what Allah Ta'ala tells you not to do in Quran, what he tells you not to do, فَانْتَهُ You should refrain from it. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ and you should do all of this out of the fear of Allah Ta'ala. Then what you will get, in Allah Shadeed al Or if you don't, in Allah Shadeed al Ikab. Because remember that indeed Allah Ta'ala is severe in His punishment. So not following Sunnah, not following Hadith. What happens? What happens if you didn't do this? In Allah Shadeed al Ikab. Indeed Allah Ta'ala is extremely severe in His punishment. But this is also the Deep importance of sunnah and hadith. Alright? Okay, source of knowledge in Islam, wahi and ghair wahi. Wahi means that knowledge which has been revealed by Allah Ta'ala 
Non wahi means knowledge that has not been revealed by Allah Ta'ala. The Quran al Kareem is that knowledge which is revealed by Allah Ta'ala in meaning and speech, kalam. So ma'na is from Allah, but kalam is from Allah, kalamullah, kitabullah, Quran. Hadith is revealed. Every hadith is knowledge revealed by Allah Ta'ala. The meaning is from Allah Ta'ala, but the words are the choice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So kalam, kalam al-Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Kalamullah, kalam al-Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then there's other sources of knowledge which are not revealed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So obviously they're contingent upon the, contingent, dependent upon the first source. Alright? That we will explain to you later when we do Islamic law tomorrow. Alright? Some common questions. Shouldn't we only, shouldn't we follow only the Quran? Why Sunnah? That I've did for you. Next, when did the compilation of Hadith literature begin? Alright. So there's a second question that is raised now. Why were the Hadith not written down at the time of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So look, if you tell me it's so important to follow Hadith, well look, you're saying this, with this Quran, copy of Quran that you're putting in front of me, is this the same, the Quran, the Sabbath? Yes. Was it written and compiled by Saba? Yes. So if a person says, okay, I'm willing to find Hadith, I will follow Hadith if you bring me a book of Hadith that you can say the same thing. If you can bring me a collection, compilation of Hadith in which you can say the same thing, it was written and compiled exactly in the order and manner that you're presenting to me in the time of Saba, I'm happy to follow it. But the reason I don't follow it is because Hadith was compiled in the third century, three centuries later. And then they will say, let's play the operator game. So I'll whisper something in his ear, he'll whisper, 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 and three centuries later, you won't get the same sentence. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Ajeeb. <laughs> How people are so easily deluded. Now, what I want to do for you, it, it's very hard. I've always, when I used to teach, was very much a bored person. We have through great difficulty, and I don't do this, but I, 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 it's great difficulty, our students who have taken many classes with us, have tried to transfer our boards to these PowerPoints. But every time I do this, there are things missing from the board, right? So one thing now I want to tell you. One thing is the transmission of Hadith. The transmission of Hadith. And the second thing is the textualization of Hadith. Don't think these two have to go together. These two are separate. One is the transmission of Hadith. The second is textualization of Hadith. One is transmission of Hadith. Second is textualization of Hadith. One is the transmission teaching this course. One day we try to make this into a book. That's the textualization of the course. Alright? These are two separate things. Now, second, is that the first is the transmission from the Prophet ﷺ to the Sahaba. The next is the transmission from Sahaba to the Tabin. And the third is the transmission from the Tabin onward. There are going to be three stages in transmission. The transmission from the Prophet ﷺ to the Sahaba was oral. One reason for that, as all of you know, and you saw it in Quran, an nabi al-Ummi, Sayyidina Rasulullah ﷺ could not write. He could not write. So his own transmission was necessarily oral. Second, and you, and this is the area of oral history, and there's a German scholar, Greg Scholler, who writes about the oral tradition. The oral tradition, the Arabs, was stronger than their written tradition. That was the nature of that civilization. And our civilization today, the written tradition, the textual tradition, is much stronger than our oral tradition. For example, the Arabs used to be, could tell you orally, 10, 15, 20 generations of their horse. <laughs> Horse, they will tell you that this horse was bred from these two, who was bred from that, who was bred from that, who was bred from that. Me and you don't even know that about our own human heritage. I know my father's name. I know my grandfather's name. I know my great-grandfather's name. That's it. <laughs> I'm being honest with you. That's me. I don't know about you. I know my father's name. I know my grandfather's name. I know my great-grandfather's name. That's it. So we are not people of orality. Of oral literacy. This is a proper term now people used to capture this. We are not people of oral literacy. I'll give you another example. The ancient Greeks also were people of an oral tradition. So these famous epics such as the Odyssey and the Iliad by Homer, these were transmitted orally. It's later they were textualized and much later the printing press is invented and they're printed. So this is a part of the earlier history of humanity which is orality. Alright? Second, 
is that the Arab had a phenomenal memory. This was commonplace for them, to memorize thousands of lines of poetry, to memorize so many aspects of their human lineage. So they were people of sharpened minds because they don't have writing. They had little writing. I think you can say they don't have writing. They were not focusing on writing. They were people of orality and oral memory. And we don't, we're not those people, so our memory isn't so sharp. Alright? Third, when Sayyidina Rasulullah wasallam was transmitting hadith, the purpose of his transmission was not to create a text. The purpose of his transmission means his narration was to create a practice. To bring about a practice. So I'll give you an example. I often give this example. So imagine there's a hadith. So I'll take an hadith that I normally take it as an example here. Kun fin dunya ka anna ka gharib o abru sabil. So the Prophet sallallahu said that be in the world like a stranger to it or as if you're just a traveler on the path. Alright. Now when the Prophet sallallahu he did say these words but he wasn't trying to create text he was trying to impart meaning and create practice. What does it mean? So do you think the next day, Sayyidina Abu Huraira, he would come back and say, Ya Rasul, I got it. He said, what? Idhar al Shabash Bitter. Kya Come to me. He said, look, I wrote it down. I got it. Kun fit dunya ka anna ka ghrib o avr sabil. If he had done that, the Prophet ﷺ would say, O oh, Abu Huraira, give me that piece of paper. Let me fold it up and put it away. Abu Huraira, I didn't say that to you to create a text from this word. I said that to you, bring me that lived life. Bring me a lived life. Bring me a life that is lived such that you feel like a stranger or a traveler in this world. That's why I said this to you. I'm not, it wasn't dictation class. So this is the answer to, okay, the Prophet didn't transmit it in written form because he was illiterate. Why didn't the Sahaba write it down? Because it wasn't dictation class. <laughs> it's not dictation class. In school, when do you do dictation? That's like first grade. <laughs> right? That's first grade. It's called dictation. Do you do that? It's called, al- it's called imla. Alright? So you say, I don't want you to capture the words on paper. I want you to capture the meaning in your heart. And live that life. And Sahaba Ikram, alhamdulillah, they did it. <laughs> they lived the life. <laughs> it's also a very important thing for you to understand. Don't be razzle-dazzled just by somebody who can narrate you words of a deed from memory. What are you going to walk away with that? You walk away with the words also. I've got, I have literally been sitting in people's homes in a room in which there's a library of Islamic books and that person confesses to me horrific sins and asks me how to be guided out of those sins. What about those books of Hadith you read? It was just words. That's just texts. Our deen is about meaning and practice. Our deen is about meaning and practice. And to retain the meaning and to practice it, it's better to have it in your memory. Don't you know that? It's better to have it in your memory. If it's in your notebook and you don't have the ability to recall it and remember it, how are you going to live by it? So after this was another worry, right? Now the Qur'an was different. Because the Qur'an is Kitabullah. Nobody calls it it's Kitab Rasul. That concept isn't there. The Qur'an is Kitabullah. So that is supposed to be a text. Kitab means text. So in that case, the Prophet did do dictation. They were called Katibin al wahi The word, they're scribes. And the Prophet would call them. And also for this reason, he initially, in the initial period, did not want any sahaba to write down a deed because, no, no, the dictation part is for Qur'an, that's kitabullah. Me, I'm teaching you sunnah, hukm, hikmah, talim al-kitab. For that, I want you to just keep it here, orality, in your mind, in your memory. You don't have to scripturalize this. Don't scripturalize it. Don't textualize it. So that there's no mistake. Unless something I say, because everything the Prophet is saying, something that I'm saying which is actually from that wahi, which is kitabullah, gets mixed with what I'm saying which from that wahi, wahi, which is my sunnah. Now the fact that this worked is the sahaba narrate the hadith onward. <laughs> they narrate it onward. Otherwise they would have told the tabi'in, oh no, I'm really sorry, I forgot all those things that the Prophet told me. But here, the Quran, <laughs> right? But I forgot. <laughs> 
You can never find that in history, not even one case like that. So history is proof that the Sahaba transmitted it onward. Alright? Okay. Now, these other questions, so I'm here still on side number two of the old one. So this was this, number two. How many types of Hadith are there? Which of them are using Lami? That's coming. Okay. Next is, what was the procedure for serving Hadith from the Prophet's time up until the 15th century? I've started that with you. I'm starting that with you. These are things to look at. We're going to see. All right? How are the words, this next thing I did for you, how are the words and deeds of the Prophet dealt with in the area of the Prophet and later the companions? All right? Memory, practice, and written form. Now to show you, first we have this issue of the oral tradition. I showed you about the horse lineage, about the thousand verses of poetry. Extraordinary memory. There's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet said that Nasr Allahu Abdan Samaya Maqalati Fahafidaha. Allah Ta'ala sends his special help on the slave who hears a statement of mine and preserves it. Or, Hafiz Aha literally from Hiv, like Hafiz, or memorizes it. So it wasn't an ordinary memory either. First they had an exceptional memory due to the old tradition, plus Allah Ta'ala sent his special help and enhanced their memory. Enhanced their memory. Alright? Written. Now this is also a common misconception that no hadith was written at all in the time of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This misconception arises, oh, sorry, I'm on side number six. So this misconception arises, well actually that's sorry, that's side number seven. In a hadith in the Sayyid of Muslim, narrated by Sayyidina Sayyidina Khudri Ibn Tada, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Prophet said, La taktub anni. The Prophet said, don't write anything that I'm telling you means other than Quran. This was true in the initial. Now remember I told you dating of hadith is very important. This was there in the early Meccan period. Now you will find later, uh, for example, in the hadith narrated in the collection of Muhammad Tirmidhi, on the next slide, old, old nine, that Sayyidina Abu Huraira, the brother of said, a man from the Ansar, so now again, when you're talking about Muhajir and Ansar, you know this is post-Hijra, you know this is a later hadith, I showed you that before, right? So a man from the Ansar, he's sitting near the Prophet Sallallahu and obviously, relatively, he's a latter Sahabi. The Muhajir were the earlier Sahaba. Ansar are the latter or later Sahaba, right? So obviously he wanted, so he said that, okay, I'm listening, but I can't memorize. So the Prophet said, make use of your right hand. That's an expression that write then. So it means the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ was that those of you who don't have that high or tradition memory, you write. But it shouldn't be written en masse. Not all of you should textualize this. Lest it be in any way confused with Qur'an. Alright? So this is a myth that no writing took place. Right? Again, people will just extrapolate this one. Okay, going back to six. Side number six. So isolated jottings for personal memory. Then collection of hadith put together for personal memory. Then a book-like compilation with chapters. Then a huge formal compilation. Right? Now you find one and two even in the time of Sahab Ikram. You will find selected hadith and you will find collections. You will find collections of hadith traced back to Sahab Ikram. Right? All right. For example, now look in this hadith and it mentioned in, in the Sunnah of Dawood, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Amr ibn Aas narrates that he used to write every single thing that the Prophet ﷺ said and the Prophet ﷺ knew that he was writing it. But don't circulate it like you circulate Quran. That's your personal use. So writing for personal notebook, you can say, that was there in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Alright? Okay, and then you have this other explanation of Umm Manin, say the Ashramana in the Sunan of Nisa'i. Alright. Writing in the second Hijri. Now, second Hijri means the, eight, the transmission of Sahaba to Tabin. So when the Sahaba received the transmission from the Prophet Sallam, they were writing. Some Sahabi saying, I wrote everything. Some saying, I took help from writing when my memory failed me. Others relying completely on their powerful memory. All of that was going. When the Tabin received second transmission, second transmission is Sahaba transmitting to Tabin, Sahaba transmitting to Tabin, you have entire huge works written at the time of the Tabin. One of this is the Kitab al from Tala. Imam Malik Rimla Tala is from the earliest of the Tabai Tabin, strictly he's not from the Tabin. 
but one of the very earliest of the Tabat a very well-known, well-taught, highly authentic collection of Hadith, having many, many topics, and there were many other books written in those times. All right? Then what happened is the third century, so this is that period from 225 to 275 Hijri, when the quote-unquote Siha Sitta were compiled. All right. Okay, now... When I, the reason why we put here as known as Seha Sitta is strictly speaking, not every hadith in these six collections are Sahih. There's only two collections from the six which call that category. That's the Sahih of Imam Bukhari and the Sahih of Imam Muslim. But because in the other four, the overwhelming majority of hadith are Sahih, so in the nisbah of that, in that majoritarian spirit, they were also referred to as, as from the Seha, from those books that are the repositories of the Sahih Adeed. So these are known as Bukhari Muslim, Nasa'i, this is incorrect English, Nasa'i, not Nasa'i, Nasa'i Abu Dawood, or if you read it together, Sunan Abi Dawood, Jami, uh, the Jami' of Tirmizi, and the Sunan of Ibn Majah. All right. Now, the first effort that took place, what happened? Why did you have these, why this effort in the third century? Because what happened was after the time of the Tabin, means in the age of the Tabai Tabin, up till this third century, was also the incidences of forgery and fabrication. One orientalist likes to call this the age of forgery and fabrication. That's a bit melodrama, right? That's incidences of forgery and fabrication. Now when that started happening, and believe, and you'd be amazed, when did it happen? It happened because of the textualization. Because when you have textualism, then people view the text as authority. Like the New York Times says, all the news that fits to print, that's fit to print. It means if we print it, it's news. <laughs> if you print it, it's true. This is also a way that people deal in the truth. That is it written? Is it printed? So now, but actually that's not for us the authenticity. Is Did the Prophet say it? Right? But then there became, once you textualized Hadith, which they started doing, right? Then the printed, hand printed, but textualized, became the marker for truth. So that made it very easier for a forger. Right? And he hadn't heard, he didn't even know who the Sahaba or who narrated, but he picked up, for example, if you want to forge a hadith, so you pick up a hadith that's come to you, and the chain is there for you. So Malik heard from Nafi, who heard from Abdullah bin Umar, who heard from Urum, or for the Prophet the sentence. So I say, okay, that's great, now I can forge, I never knew these things before. I would have had to go and orally present to people, and they would have caught, poked holes in my, I would, they would have ran me out of town, if I had to go to the masjid and try to orally forge a hadith. Very difficult. But when it became textualized, very easy now. I'll just cut and paste the chain and just add whatever I want, write whatever I want. <laughs> and in fact, now I even know that this is a chain that people respect. Hmm? Right? So you may be thinking, how did they catch such a person? That's coming later. Oh, just in- but that's, I can barely show you that. But there's an incredible way they caught such people. Right? One way they caught such people, I'll show you a little bit of an example to keep it a bit easier for you. So that person copied the chain. What? That Nafi said, that uh, Abdullah bin Umar said, that Sayyidina Umar Nafi said, that the Prophet said. But the problem was that this guy didn't realize when he copied that he can't prove that he ever met Nafi. Right? He can't prove that. <laughs> and the Muhaddis looked at this and they looked at Lika, who met who and who is known to have studied under who and who is known to have narrated under who because when they were textualizing the Hadith, they also had these halakas of Hadith and the attendance would be written. And the muhaddis, such as Nafi in this case, or some other muhaddis, would keep a record of who is my student, because when they wrote the hadith, they also made the system of ijaza, ijaza to hadith. Who has my license and permission to write hadith? So when you look at all the people who were authorized by Nafi to relate from him, this guy's not on the list. So you caught him. When you caught him, then you tag, you, you tag him, and any hadith that has him, it's all maldu, it's gone. Whether he's narrates from Nafi or somebody else. This is one example. There are many tools they had to, de- to detect these forges and fabrications. But it started at the age of textualization. So then there was a bit of a pause now. And then the Muhaddithin said, okay now, we, in addition to narration, of course, there's some sea seekers, we'll keep narration, keep transmission. Textualization is already done. But now what we better do is, because everybody is putting any parchment together. So now what we have to do is create a canon of Hadith. A canon means a definitive, authoritative set of collected works that becomes the reference now. 
And so if anybody finds some other little hand, handout or booklet, they'll know, no, 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 if the muhaddithin did not put it in these collections, it's not okay. So that's why they made, this was the age of hadith, canonical compilation. Alright? Are you getting an f- idea? You're getting a feeling? Right? Are you realizing also how little you know about the history of hadith compilation? You think you've understood it? I haven't touched the surface yet. <laughs> I haven't touched the surface. Alright? There's a lot of effort. A lot of effort that went in. So this is about as much as I can tell you because we're still doing the first people who deny hadith. Right? Okay? This was another aspect of denial of hadith that is not been authoritatively, authentically transmitted. Okay? Alright. Now, this I did for you. That in order for hadith to contribute to the shia, you had to separate the you had to separate the authentic from the inauthentic. This started from the Tabi and went up to 200 or so Hijri because from 225 you had the definitive compilations being compiled. Right? And that's true up till today. If somebody today comes and brings a Hadith and it's not in any compilation from that time, it's not just the six, there are many others. There are earlier ones, Motiv Imam Malik, Muslim Imam Ahmad. There's some slightly later ones like from Imam al-Bayhaqi, for example. Many people put Imam al-Bayhaqi, which is fourth, fifth century, uh, early fifth century, late fourth century at the basic end of definitive, authoritative, compiled works of Hadith. All right? So now you can't, uh, nobody can come up with anything anymore. It's finished. So it's all actually located in history. I told you historical approach, the whole discussion had nothing to do with today. This is, chapter was completely done because it's a finite material. It's not like science you keep discovering new things. The Hadith is a finite known material and the Muhaddithin spent two centuries entirely sifting, processing, labeling, tagging, sorting this material. Then it was done. Nobody tried to touch it until the late 20th century Nasruddin al-Labani. Nobody ever dared to regrade a hadith. But he came out with his own collections. He said, I have my own version of Tirmidhi. I call it the Sahih of Tirmidhi. I have my, I change. Imam Abdul said this is Sahih. I say it's Zayf. He actually changes gradings. Nobody has done that prior to him. This is unheard of. This is like what we call a renegade, maverick, outlier activity. But the amazing thing is so many people just accept that one person. They take the one over the many. Right? All right, now the hidden agenda. Ready? Or part two. Now this is for those who accept Hadith. Oh, wait. Today's hidden agenda. Sanad, the name of the game is Sanad. How are you going to determine a Hadith, whether it's Sahih, it's Hassan, it's Zaif, what's going on, it's called Sanad. So understand now, Sanad is, strictly speaking, the chain of narrators. All right? Sanad. Sanad is the chain of narrators, or you can say the chain of narration. Isnad means to attribute hadith to the Prophet ﷺ through a chain of narration slash narrators. And matan, matan means the text of the hadith, the content material, the text of the hadith. Alright? Now, there's also a way to look at the matan, both when you're trying to detect a forgery fabrication, there was also matan analysis and son of the analysis. And also when you're trying to grade the hadith, and that there's also son of the analysis and matan analysis. What I'm going to be able to do for you is a limited perspective of son of analysis. Alright? Tomorrow in Islamic law, I will show you a bit of the matan analysis. Okay? Because the jurists are a bit more concerned with the meanings, and the hadith scholars are more concerned with the chains of narration and the individual narrators. Alright. Apparently it appears that the son of is flat. But does it mean that you will just see slide number three, name after name after name, on the authority of so-and-so who narrated from so-and-so, narrated from so-and-so, narrated from a sahabi, or the other, narrated from Rasulullah But the reality is, is that not every sanad is the same, depending on the generations and the generation of the narrator in each link in the sanad. So it's a way to quote-unquote put contours to give some color, shape, perspective, dimension to this otherwise apparently flat sanad, you have to look at the generation, which in Arabic is called tabakat. Tabakat. The second thing you have to do is look at the number of narrators of that hadith in any particular generation. That also makes a big difference in how high or low we are going to rank that hadith in the hierarchy of knowledge. Alright? So you start here. So this is one type of hadith 
before you do Sahih Hasan and Zayif, there's another classification that is supposed to be done. The first is called Mutawatir. Mutawatir means that there are multiple Sahaba who narrate that Hadith. Okay? Alright. I'm going to do this twice for you, just so you can see. There's another Hadith that only one Sahabi has narrated it. There's only one Sahabi who's narrated that Hadith. But there are multiple Tabin who have narrated from that single Sahabi. So the multiplicity of narrators, if it takes place in the first generation, if the multiplicity of narrators is found in the generation of Sahaba, Mutawatir. If there's single narrator, I'm going to do this a second time for you. In the generation of Sahaba, so don't write it down yet, because I'm going to do it a second time for you, the more refined thing. And the multiplicity is found in the generation of secondary Tabin, that's called Mashur. Alright? Okay. So the Mashur is that Hadith which was well known in the days of the Sahaba. Now what does it mean? Now in order to have a lot of Tabin, who are Tabin? Tabin are the people who met the Sahaba. So actually Tabin exists in the age of the Sahaba, like the Sahaba existed in the age of Rasulullah sallallahu the zamana, right? So if the Tabin, look at the slide number five, are narrating a lot of hadith, they are doing so in the presence of Sahaba, in the age of Sahaba, means with the knowledge of Sahaba. So that's why it's a special category. So the Sahaba themselves are not multiple narrators of the hadith, but let's say Sayyidina Abu Har narrates the hadith, and now the Tabin are just narrating it, so the other Sahaba are content, okay, this hadith has now reached the Ummah, because we see now so many Tabin are narrating it. So we'll get busy sharing the other hadith. The Sayyidina Abu has not yet taught the people. You get an idea? Right? Okay? This is also a simple thing that people don't realize. And they say, oh, why did only one Sahabi narrate it? And I said, no, but they're ten Tabin. But no, but they're Tabin. How come there's only one? Those ten are narrating it in the full knowledge, awareness, presence, and the age of Sahaba. Alright? Okay. Next type of hadith. Okay, sorry. Now to show you this idea, so this is some timeline. Zero here means zero Hijri. Okay? So Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Then you have Sahaba Ikram Radiyallahu Anhu. Then you have what are known as the younger companions. So if you look here, the bottom of the bar of the younger companions, they only caught the last, you can say, couple of years, last few years of the life of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the benefit of that was that they got to, they were around much longer with the Ummah. Second is they learned from their senior Sahaba. They had a long period here, right? So up till 40, 41, 2 Hijri, alright? Then you have, now this is the disciples, are those Tabin who were the specialist students of Sahaba Ikram, of the younger Sahaba, and who spent their life learning Hadith from those younger Sahaba, and narrating those hadiths to the next generation, which is Tabai Tabin. Within Tabai Tabin, you have what we call the pivotal generation, because those is the generation of the authentic transmitters who make it to the textual compilations known as the quote-unquote Sehasita and others. Alright? That is the pivotal generation. Alright. This I showed you the other day, just to give you an idea, right? If you remember, we did this that 19 Sahaba, and their names are there for you, narrated 92% of the Sahih of Bukhari, and 89% almost of all the Hadith in the major textual compilations. Alright, this I explained to you a couple of days ago. Those of you who were here would remember that. Alright, so the notion here is again, that this was a specialized activity. Now a question that sometimes people ask here, is I want you to look in this list, and you will not see the name of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq with Allah ta'ala anhu. You won't see his name. He's not from one of the top names. He did narrate hadith, but he narrated less than 188. Alright? So the question is why? Why is his name not there? Because Sayyidina Rasulullah s.a.w. lived for just two and a half years after the Prophet s.a.w. and he was busy being the Khalifa. Khalifa to Rasul Amir Mu'mineen. Alright? So that was, a, that, that was a specialized activity done by one. That was super specialist activity. And there were so many other Sahaba who in his knowledge and awareness and in his age of Khilafah were narrating Hadith to these new Tabin. So he didn't view the need to do it. 
All right? But this also shows you the understanding within Sahaba that narration of hadith is a very delicate matter. Teaching hadith, darsa hadith, is a very delicate matter, requires extremely specialized knowledge. All right? Okay? All right. So, here, this is the thing that we've also already mentioned for you. All right. After the mutawatir and mashur hadith, all other hadith are known as khabar wahid. Khabar wahid. It means that there's not multiplicity of narrators in the generation of Sahaba, nor is there multiplicity of narrators in the generation of the Tabi'in. Such a hadith is called a khabar wahid in the terminology of the muhaddithin. All right. Now I want to go back to slide number four. What is the number of companions required to make a hadith mutawatir? The number of companions required to make hadith mutawatir is not specified by any hadith scholar. It's the number that makes you feel that a plurality exists. I did this concept of tawatir for you before. It's like what in science they call empirical adequacy. I did that for you yesterday morning. The first day I did tawatir. One person comes says it's raining. Two come, three come, four come. When do you get yakin? Right? That is absolute definitive certain knowledge. The second thing is that when you bring matan analysis, it depends on the subject matter of the text. If Sayyidina Rasulullah is talking about how to make wudu, so that is what we call kathir al buku That is something that will occur to all the sahaba. They all have to make wudu. So for that type of hadith, you would want to see a larger number of sahaba narrating it in order to tag it as a mutawatir. But if, for example, Sayyidina Rasulullah is talking about a rare case in inheritance, such as how much will the paternal grandmother get in the event that the parents aren't alive, well, that doesn't happen to so many people, right? Because normally the grandparents die, then parents die, then the children die. It's relatively rare that somebody, not an infant, but somebody who had wealth to leave behind, has a surviving grandparent. So this would have been Nadir al buku Very few Sahaba would have ever heard that. And so few would narrate that. So there maybe we can find three sahaba will be willing to call it mutawatir. So actually it's not multiple versus one. So this was slightly misleading because I couldn't capture that in a PowerPoint for you, right? <coughs> Mashur doesn't mean one sahabi. There's a number, mutawatir means so many sahaba narrated that hadith that it leads us to a view that it's absolutely certain. Mashur means any number less than that, but at least one. So it's not just one. Any number less than the number the muhaddith feels would qualify a hadith to be mutawatir, but definitely, obviously, there is one, because otherwise the chain is, there's no chain if it doesn't go back through a sahaba. Right? So normally, uh, the mashur hadith is actually normally two or three or four or something like that. But even if it's one, which actually, sorry, the mashur hadith can be two or three or four sahaba, but it is often one, but the difference here is then the multiplicity of the tabi. Right? So now you will see mutawatir. So a lot of companions. Three is not a number here. Three is just to denote plurality. Lots of sahaba and lots of tabin, but which ones? Now I told you, now we're talking about the ones I told you, the disciple, the disciple tabin. Then which one of the tabai tabin? The madar generation. Then next comes the topical collections. That's Imam Bukhari. This is Imam Muslim. This is where they come in the chain. And then a second generation Hadith critic. This is also another category of people. But I, we don't have time to show you that. Alright? Now watch this. I'm in slide 16. Watch him. This is a Mutawatir. This is a Mashur. So the multiplicity is in the starting not from the first but the second generation. This is the Khabar Wahid. Now this is called the normal Khabar Wahid. The multiplicity starts not in the first nor in the second, but the third generation. But the multiplicity are the Madar scholars, the pivotal, the pivotal scholars of that generation. Another type is a barely acceptable Khabar Wahid. There at least one pivotal scholar, one pivotal scholar is narrating it. And then, watch this, this is if there's no, only one pivotal, sorry, this was one pivotal scholar, but multiple topical collections, which are also senior Mahdi So I find it in the Sa'i, I find it in the book of Abu Dawud, I find it in Bukhari, right? And the next was that, okay, no, one, one, one. Falsism, obviously one, only one Sahabi, only one from the Tabin, but what type of 
from the disciple Tabin, only one from the Tabai Tabin, but a pivotal generation scholar, only one, it's only in one of the major topical collections, right? But many of the Hadith critics after that took it, and then there's another one, now look for the uh, X, the next one is that it's too rare that we won't accept it, right? There's only so many generations where you will tolerate a single narrator. Now this is a very simplified version, right? It depends on the seniority of that single link. That's a huge discussion which I cannot capture to you in a PowerPoint, all right? Now another thing I will tell you is that the further you go down in the hierarchy, so there's no real debate between mutawatir hadith. There's no debate in mashur hadith. It means they're all sahih. The question of being sahih, hasan, or zayf arises in the khabar wahid. All right? That's the first thing. The question of being sahih, hasan, or zayf arises in the khabar wahid. So that I think is here. So there's mutawatir, side number 22. There's mashur, and then there's khabar wahid. So the yellow from the Khabar Wahid, then we're going to go in this discussion. Is it Sahih? Is it Hassan? Is it Zayf? Or is it Mawdu'a? Or was it fabricated? Alright? Okay. Now, I'll pause over here and, and tell you now it gets deeper. Hmm? It gets deeper because there's multiple positions of Hadith scholars. So actually, the real classification would be this. That that Hadith, the Sanad, that all the early Hadith scholars agreed to be Sahih. That Hadith which some scholars held the Sanad was Sahih, some thought it was Hassan. That's level 2. Level 3, all agreed that it was Hassan. Level 4, some felt it was Hassan, some felt it was Zayf. Level 5, all agreed that it was Zayf. There's more also. Level 6, there's a particular category of Zayf which is sometimes we call it a wahi, I haven't shown it here, wahi, or sometimes it's called zayf jiddan. You can say extremely weak, but still not fabricated. So level, what level was I know? Sahi, hasan, sahi, hasan, hasan, zayf, zayf. Level six, some of the scholars felt it was the tolerable zayf, and some felt it was the wahi, which is extremely weak, which is near intolerable. Seven, all the scholars felt it was wahi. Extremely weak. Eight, some felt it was extremely weak, and some felt it was maldu, fabricated. And nine, all of them agreed it was maldu. So actually there are nine levels of hadith. When you start looking at more than just one book of hadith criticism. Alright? It's deep, believe me. Aapki basmane me or aapki aapko Right? I can keep opening it up for layers and layers and layers. Right? I'll give you another example. Now let's look at just one narrator <laughs> in one chain. Right? If I have that for you. All right. Let's take one hadith. So my colleague, a uh, wonderful person by the name of Malana, Dr. Fadakhar Zaman, he did his entire PhD on one hadith. Entire PhD at University of Chicago on one hadith. That was also tried to be captured here in PowerPoint. Now I don't know if you, because you're not familiar with these names, right? Hadith called a person who wants to go into this issue of hadith grading, right? You have to know every name on the slide. You have to know everything about them. You have to know who met who, whose comments were what about who, how the hadith critics evaluated them. You have to know the multiplicity of positions. It's called a PhD. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 17 plus 29 is 46, 56, 62. So one is there's 62 chains here right, that were looked at, that was just the 62 chains that came from one Sahabi, Sayyidina Sa'ad. And then there were other narrators of this, right? 62 chains of narrators. You have to know every single one of those 62. Now there's a, what is a genre, it's known as Ilmu Asma Rijal. That is the knowledge of the names and biographies of those narrators. There's a second genre, Ilmu Jahar wa Ta'deel, the knowledge of Grading the narrators. Now the grading system is very refined. And another thing is different Hadith scholars use different grades, grading systems. So for example, let's say I pick up one of these Hadith, one of these 29. So going from Saad to Amr ibn Asa to Zuhri to one of his eight students to one of the 29 who narrated from one of his eight students. So I look up that narrator and I want to see what did the Hadith scholars say about him. 
They said he's big, he becomes Zayf. So I'm looking up narrator X. Okay, now when I have to look it up in five, six, seven collections. Now the critic one, his system of grading is A, B, C, D, F. So he gives him a B plus. The other one is grading on a 4.0 scale. He gives him a 3.2. Yeah, that's it because they use different terms. There wasn't any single codified terms. There are certain very common terms. There was a lot of sharing. But there was also distinct terms that some of them would use. Now I'm trying to get a feel. Right? Now, what happens is, so this is a very good way I can explain because a lot of your students, alright? Now what happens is, I see that five of them gave him A minus or a B plus. That's good enough to be Hassan, right? Alright, so I label the Hadith as Hassan. Okay. What happens is, Nasruddin al-Bani goes to the library in Damascus and he reads evaluator number seven. Evaluator number seven gave him a D. So he says, I've done breathtaking, groundbreaking new research, and I've discovered that this hadith in the collection of the Jami of Imam Tirmidhi, which Imam Tirmidhi labeled as Hassan, this hadith is actually Zayf. He said, well, how did you get that? And he gives you a footnote. Such and such, and it's a 100% reputed, authoritative hadith critic, so-and-so said that this narrator in this hadith is Zayf. So you say, oh, I don't believe you, Albani, I'm going to look it up. You look it up, and you'll find it's true. You look up the Hadith in Tirmidhi, this is the chain of narrators mentioned, that narrator's name is there. You look up that narrator name and the reference he gave, Hadith critic number 7, Hadith critic 7, gave him a D. But we didn't realize is that the true Mahadithin looked that narrator up in 7 places and saw 6 out of 7 gave him a minus B plus and number 7 gave him a D. They discounted the grade of the one who gave him a D. And not just the statistics, they have reasons for that also. They have reasons. They will even write. And so and so has erred in viewing this narrator to be Zayf. Sometimes they say, for example, because he mistaken him with a different Sa'ad. Or because he thought that this, they actually even many times address why the person gave him a D and say he was wrong. But you won't see that. All you need is a footnote. All you will see is a footnote. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's Zayf. <laughs> I got the footnote. I got the reference. Imam Dhabi said he's Zayf. So what, you don't think the Madhuthi knew what Imam Zahabi wrote? <laughs> of course they did. This was part of the research. <laughs> Do you understand how, how these mistakes are made? Right? But it's not easy to go through all of them. <laughs> this is a huge workshop. The biggest workshop is Hadith. It's bigger than Tafsir. The most difficult area of Islamic studies in terms of size of workshop is Hadith. The most difficult area in terms of meaning the hardest, the biggest workshop to build, hadith. The hardest workshop to navigate, fiqh. And that's why people make mistakes in these two like anything. Alright? Another thing I will tell you. Another thing. Now, let's give an example that there is a student who is a C average student. Does it mean he will always get a C? He could take my class and get an A, can't he? Of course he can. So this is another thing. That okay... But this, but that's an also said that look, this person labeled him a D because he was looking and it's true. He found that, for example, Amr wrongly narrated this hadith. And we all agree with that. However, here, we view that Amr did not make a mistake. For example, Amr's weakness in memory was not mu'athir, did not lead him to make a mistake here because we have other corroborating evidences such as all these other narrations that you see. Oh, he's 29, we've got 28 other ones who said the teacher said that. So number 29 is a complete D student, but he's giving the same answer that the other 28 are doing. So we know that he got it right. <laughs> the D kid wrote an A paper. It happens. <laughs> it happens. Ask the kids who have a 2.0. <laughs> they say, sometimes I get A minus. I do. I do sometimes get an A minus. Ask him. <laughs> but you'd have to know, you'd have to know the other 28 before you made the decision on the 29th. That's why Albani didn't do that other research. So he didn't look at the other six of the seven critics on that one narrator, and he didn't look at the other 28 chains of that hadith. He just looked at the one of the 29. He didn't look at the other 28 of the 29. Okay, that's too much work for anybody in this world. Even with all the computers and databases, people can't do it. The Mahdithin were living computers, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, in the course of my PhD, tried to chase one. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and everything was there. Everything was there in the early books. Everything, I found it. I couldn't believe how, how are they doing that. I'm using, I was using full searchable CD-ROM databases. 
of over 7,000 books in Arabic is called Maktub Tashamila. I had ulama, teachers helping me with this. I said, I'm going wild trying to find this, right? I had teams of people on teams of laptops searching these things. And I found them in the works of the Mahdathin written in pen and paper. I've experienced it. That's what I know. You haven't experienced it. So what can I do? How much can I show you behind the scenes? Your ability to understand is stopped here. I'm not trying to be mean. There's certainly you know, somebody who's a physicist. He can talk to you about popular science. But if he starts talking to you about the stuff he talks to PhD physics students about, I won't be able to understand him anymore. Right? So that's just a reality. You have to accept that. You have to learn to trust the tradition. There's so much that goes into the grading of a hadith. So much that goes into the evaluating of a narrator. Okay, there's a second thing. Let's say you have multiple chains of transmission and everyone has a weak narrator. Everyone. Every single one. And that weak narrator is in a different generation. Let me do that also. And in a different place. Let me do that also. I could do it with you right now. I'll pretend this line is Yemen, this is Damascus, this is Kahira, this is Makkah Makarma, this is Medina Manawra, this is mm, Baghdad. Right? And all of the first ones, because all Sahaba are trustworthy. There's no question of anybody, nobody evaluates Sahaba narrators. This is what it means to be Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a. Right? But let's say on this line, row three is weak, on this line, row four is weak, on this line, number five is weak, on this line, number six is weak, etc., etc. It's a different generation, different place. <laughs> right? But in the back end, which is the Hadith compilers, it's all the same text. So that's not mutton analysis. We have corroboration. <laughs> because it's not possible. There was no SMS that from Yemen to Makkah Makarma to Medina Murat to Cairo to Damascus to Baghdad, they could have all have colluded, colluded, conspired, mutually cooperated to create the same lie. That's not possible. So that's another reason. Well, we're saying that the is not zayf, it's fine. But we will tag the individual hadith and the individual chain still with the word zayf. So that's another thing they'll confuse you with. That look, Imam Abu Nifa based his legal ruling on this hadith and this hadith is found in the collection of Abu Daud and not Nasr al Imam Abu Daud called it zayf. You say, yes, we, I call it zayf also. But the point is that this same text in the hadith has been translated, transmitted through so many multiple chains that that multiple chains leading with the same text corroborates the text and elevates it beyond the level of weak. But that's not written in the work of Imam Dawood. He just wrote Zayf next to it. You didn't catch us on anything. 100% that he says Zayf, Imam Dawood calls it Zayf. But it's not Zayf. <laughs> that single, single chain of narration through which Imam Abu Dawood is narrating it, that is Zayf. That the person says, no, but I found to me it's also Zayf. I said, yes, everywhere you will find it, it will be Zayf. Mention it Zayf. So that's something that says, look, Imam Munifa based his ruling on this decision. Every single tech, every single work of Hadith that has this Hadith has called it Zayf. I say, yes, but they all have it with the same text across different generations, across different places. That's corroboration. The jurist and Muhaddithin understood that. I could keep going. <laughs> There's so much... <laughs> That has gone into this. And so many ways you can be misguided and pull quoted by this word Zayf. The word Zayf has been used as a weapon in Islamic scholarship today thanks to this ideology. And that is wrong. <laughs> That's completely wrong. This was an academic category that the Muhaddithi made to identify something. It wasn't the final be-all, end-all, decisive weapon to be used as a weapon. That your hadith is Zayf, his hadith is Zayf. My to say, your this is Zayf. It's not like that at all. Alright? Okay. It's up to you. You want to come back after us, sir? I could show you more. There's a lot that I, there's but a lot that we didn't put for you here. This is to address those people who say I only accept the hadith that are in Sahih Muslim. So that's the question. That look, if it's really a hadith, why did Imam Muslim not narrate it? This is another one of the biggest conceptions. Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim their purpose in compiling their work was not, was not, and no Hadith scholar and no true Saudi Salafi scholar will ever say this either. Popular speakers say this. No Saudi scholar will ever say this. Because they're true scholars. They also know. The purpose of Imam Bukhari is not, I'm going to gather all the Sahih Hadith that are out there. No, that's not his purpose. 
His purpose was Imam Bukhari's work is actually a work to defend the legal positions he agrees with. So the certain legal positions he agrees with, he felt that, okay, I'm going to make a textbook of hadith evidences for the legal rulings that I agree with. So I will search through the hadith corpus and look for, number one, those hadith that are evidences for the legal positions I agree with and only take the ones that are sahih. And Imam Muslim was the same way. So I'll show you, so I'll show you from Imam Muslim saying it himself. Imam Muslim is saying himself. So this is the hadith of Imam Muslim, Imam Ta'ala. Alright. And there's a hadith number 404 and there's a hadith previous to 403. So this is a long hadith, right? Uh, basically this is the issue of should you raise your hands after ruku. Right? Okay. Now you, you move over here. Here it is, hadith 404. In the hadith, oh sorry, this is the hadith of reciting, uh, behind uh, the imam when the imam is reciting in salah. So in the hadith of Jirir from Suleiman from Qatada, there is the addition, additional words. So hadith 403 doesn't have these additional words. Then there's mention in 404 when the imam recites the Quran, be quiet. The Muslim student, this is, a, this is an explanation for you. That's not written there. It just says in the text of Abu Ishaq said. Who was Abu Ishaq? He was imam Muslim student who was narrating this hadith from him. He said that, oh, Abu Bakr ibn Uqtah ibn Nadir has criticized the sedition in hadith. So Muslim, Imam Muslim replied that, do you want me to find somebody even more liable than Suleiman? Means if you criticize this edition, I'll find you this edition through a reliable source. No problem. That's not an issue. It also shows you uh, the feeling, right? Okay. Abu Ishaq then said, the student said, that so what about Abu Huraira's hadith? That contains the similar words. Imam Muslim said, it is sahih. Abu Ur's hadith contains the words that when the imam recites, be quiet. So Abu Ishaqi asked his teacher, and this is printed in the Arabic. In some of these contemporary Salafi translations, they don't translate this for you in English. And some do, right? So Abu Ishaqi asked his teacher, so why didn't you include it here? The imam Muslim responds, because I haven't included everything that is sahih in my opinion in this book. I'm not, my purpose of it isn't to include every sahih hadith. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm trying to document the hadith that support the legal positions that I agree with. I believe that the person sh- should recite behind the imam. He shouldn't re- be quiet. So I brought the sahih hadith that supports that position. There is sahih hadith that say other things. 100% he's saying, I say it's sahih. There's a hadith of Abu Ayyad that says when the imam recites, be quiet. Imam Muslim saying, I believe it's sahih. His student said, but why didn't you put it here? He says, I'm not trying to br- teach you all the sahih hadith. We're not, we're not doing that here. This isn't sahih hadith 101. This is a, when a great misconception that has been propagated and allowed to spread where the scholars know it's a complete outright lie that Imam Bukhari was trying to gather all the sahidith or Imam Muslim was trying to gather all the sahidith. Then to show you, Imam Muslim, Imam Muslim's teacher, Al-Hazmi, but he's not the teacher, he's recording this, that someone came to Imam Muslim, Imam Muslim's teacher, Abu Zura. And he brought to him the sahih, that look, your student has compiled a collection of hadith, which is called the sahih. Abu Zura said that he has opened the door for those who will espouse reprehensible new religious views. So that when we bring a hadith and argument against them, they will be able to say, this isn't in the sahih. He predicted this, that this is going to cause a problem. Because actually he isn't actually trying to compile all the hadith that are sahih. He knew because he was his teacher. He's only compiling those hadith that agree with his legal opinion. But he predicted that later on this is going to cause a problem because people are going to think that this is some definitive compilation of sahih hadith. And when we bring a hadith to someone, they'll say, oh, I don't accept it because it's not in the sahih of Imam Muslim. Like people did say, I don't accept it, it's not in the sahih of Bukhari or Muslim. Alright? So then, when Imam Muslim met another person who was harsh with him, that why did you do this? And scolded him on this book. And told him what your own teacher said. Imam Muslim said that, look, I have compiled this work and said that the work consists of sahih hadith. I haven't said that any and every hadith that I haven't included in this is not sahih. I haven't said that. But I was our new people are going to think that. And that's what you, most people think today. Hmm? Which is the same for the sahih of Imam Bukhari. That's another thing that Imam Bukhari only believed in sahih hadith. No. Imam Bukhari has written many works of hadith, compiled many works of hadith. Only one of them did he not narrate Zayf Hadith. In every single other Hadith work of his, he has freely narrated Zayf Hadith because he also believes Zayf Hadith to be part of the Sunnah. 
This was the particular work where he said, I only want to include Sahih Hadith in this. Alright? Okay? That's another thing. That's another thing I'll tell Imam Bukhari, even in his quote-unquote Sahih, there are all Zayif Hadith there. What Imam Bukhari does, he has chapter headings. This is known as Tarjamatul Bab. He puts a chapter heading and then he lists some Hadith under that chapter heading. Sometimes in that chapter heading, he tries to explain what the legal position is that he agrees with, so that a person understands why these hadiths are being brought. Sometimes in order to explain his legal position, he actually cites a Zayf hadith in the chapter heading, which is part of his work called the Sahih. But the difference is the way you can tell is whenever he cites a Zayf hadith in that work, he won't mention the chain. <laughs> and he doesn't mention the narrators, you will have no way of knowing that it's Zayf. <laughs> He will just say, Qawla Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he will mention the statement, the text, just the matan only. Because that matan is actually where the legal opinion is coming from, but that happens to be Zifadis. Now when that matan gives you the meaning of the legal opinion, then as corroborating evidence for it, he brings some sahih that don't exactly fully say that, but if you accept that, this supports that. That's a whole other thing to show you. But this is beyond beginner's level. Alright? And this is all stuff that has been written in the classical and medieval Arabic tradition. It's nothing Saudi versus Desi, Diobandi, Hanafi versus Salafi. This is all a myth. Everything I'm telling you is from the classical medieval pre-India, pre-Diobandi, not Hanafi, right? Not necessarily Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, all types of things. So Hadith is a very, very, very complicated area. So you basically have no choice if you ask me other than do etamad and the magdisin. That's my position and I have no qualms arguing it forcefully. You have no choice other than, than to do etamad on the classical tradition of magdisin because your ability to do tahkik in this realm, it's not even possible to do a tahkik that can master tahkik yet. Maftikhir Zaman is one of the most brilliant human beings I've ever met in my life. <laughs> and it took an entire PhD to do one hadith. It's just not possible. You can't reach the level of tahkik of the Mahdithin of the past. There's something, and science accepts that. They say, we're not going to re-question Einstein's theories. <laughs> they said it's finished. <laughs> there's some things that, there's some things that you sealed the debate. <laughs> there's some things that the past authority was so, such an expert that is done, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's no need for Nasr and Nabani to reinvent the wheel on the Muhaddithin. Even for you to do the tahqiq on a single hadith and try to research what Nasr al-Din al-Albani said and what the classical Muhaddithin said, even that's not in your ability. So the irony is that people have chosen to do blind following because they don't have tahqiq and the same thing you're going to see tomorrow in fiqh. To understand all of Hanafi, Fiqh and Usul, it's not in your ability. <laughs> right? But just in the tripping you up with one word, taklid, you have been convinced not to do that itamad and reliance. And you're missing out on so much depth. <laughs> you're missing out on so much understanding. Alright? Khair, now four theory, that's the most we could do. This is a very long subject. Very long subject. Uh, all right. Jazakumullah khairs and jazak questions. Why is it that the leaders of the Salaf do not agree despite such clear proofs of the rest of the ulama? Basically, it has to do with loyalty. And there's a certain loyalty that a group of scholars have chosen to have for Nasruddin al-Bani or Ibn Taymiyyah or Ibn al-Qalim al jaziyah There were five classical scholars. They don't all agree with each other. Imam al-Dawud al-Zahiri. Ibn Hazm, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim al Jaziyah, and Ash Shokani. But this is coming tomorrow. These are five big names who also had departures from the classical tradition. But Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim al Jaziyah, I personally rather try to keep them in the tradition. Ibn Hazm and the Zahiri outside the tradition. Even Ibn Taymiyyah would probably agree with that. Shokani is actually just a follower of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al Qayyim, but because he's such a prolific writer, we're mentioning him in his own right. So a lot of it has to do with loyalty, has to do with affinity. It has to do with something I'll explain to you tomorrow. A tabi, a, an, an aversion to multiplicity. 
And a lot of ordinary people have. That's why a lot of ordinary educated Muslims end up being Salafi because there's an inherent aversion to multiplicity. It's too much. When I build a workshop of a date, they look at it and say, I can't handle that. I can't navigate such a diverse and multiple set of positions. So they need a simplified version. And the simplified version is there. It's not to be found here. That's why you can see every best attempt, PowerPoint and everything, it just this can't be simplified. It just can't be done. So one is for due to loyalty. A second is due to the quest for simplification. Third is, I could tell you, the quest for easy understanding. If you just accept what Ibn Taymiyyah said, it's very easy to say, I've understood fiqh. But if you go back and read the people he's correcting or critiquing, you will come out confounded. <laughs> you will again end up with the multiplicity. And many people in their minds, they can't handle that. They can't tolerate that. They want a decision. They want to know. They want a decision. Like I told the boy wants to know, can I marry her or not marry her? If you were there on day one. He says, what are you talking about? <laughs> Ibn Taymiyyah said this, and Imam Shafi said that, Imam Manifa said this, Imam Malik said that. They can't handle it. <laughs> and so because they want simplicity, with the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Sunni Madhabi tradition, says we can't give it to you. And the other one says, I'll give it to you. So they say, well, this is what I want. And they're saying it does exist. So that resonates more with me. That's more intuitive to me. They're saying it does exist. They're saying there's only one way to pray according to the Sunnah. That That's my preconceived notion. So that resonates with me. So they go over there. They go over there. All right? How did Arabs make sure to retain the authenticity of oral poetry and other important records? Basically, this is through multiple recitation. Right? So, we normally don't like to open this up for you, but if you really open this up, then there's a whole Orientalist critique even on the transmission of Quran. Because if you're an atheist, you can't accept that the Quran is the word of God, right? So you have to come to some alternative understanding of that history. So they'll do the same thing over there. That well, the Quran was gathered by Sayyidina Abu Bakr and compiled by Sayyidina Umar and Nashr al-Quran by Sayyidina Uthman. So how do we know it was the real thing? Then they'll go into this very complicated issue of Saba Asharikarat and Saba Ahraf and all of these things. Alright? It can get very complicated. But basically it's through public recitation. Right? So if you have all these Sahaba narrating Hadith, if one Sahabi is narrating it differently, all the other Tabin will say, but well, all the other seven Sahaba said this and you said this. So it takes place in the public realm. It takes place in the public realm. Okay, the question is, is that Fattabi'uni, you said it means to follow the Prophet. Why doesn't it mean to follow Allah? Okay, so this is a principle of Arabic grammar. It's called Muqul. When Allah Ta'ala tells the Prophet Muhammad Kul. So he's telling the Prophet some you proclaim. So what comes after the Kul, it is Kalamullah, it is Quran, but it is Allah Ta'ala telling the Prophet Muhammad what he should proclaim. So the speaker after Kul is the Prophet Sallallahu Kul Kul. Right? So the Prophet is speaking, he's the one who's saying Fattabi'uni, that you should follow me. So the me there refers back to the Prophet Sallallahu That is just a principle of Arabic language, linguistics, grammar. There's no difference of opinion on that. What about the hadith explaining Qiyamah and other futuristic events? Why were they not textualized? No, definitely you will find a hadith on Qiyamah in these textual compiled collections. Not just the ones that came in the 200s, but even in the Muatta, the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, by the way, also. An extremely important hadith collection for you to see the early textualization. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal Rehmullah Ta'ala was also from the Tabai Tabin, well before Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam Tirmid al Nasai, etc. And his work is even longer than any of them. You will find many such hadith like that. Is it fair to the Ahl Quran to denounce their arguments without any of them being present here to present their view? In my opinion, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. I have no qualms with that. I don't believe that I have to call every single person of every different, every different school of thought and engage in a discussion and debate with them. And nor do they ever call me <laughs> over in the Ahl Quran gathering. No, that's not required. This is a myth also that some of you have. That in order to have scholarship, everybody must be there. And I want to sit there and watch a wrestling match. So I want him to speak. I want the Ahl Quran to speak. I want the one, I want Javin Ghandi's representative to speak. I want that popular BA and Medina University Salafi speaker to speak who only believes in Sahih. I want the Saudi scholar to be flown from Saudi who believes in Sahih, Hassan and Zif, but has a different understanding of Zif. You can travel to all of them if you want. Uh, but there's no single platform 
that will offer you. Now, there is, and the reason I'm saying this is that in every scholarly understanding, there are going to be some positions that we view are also valid. And there are some positions that we view that are invalid. I view the Ahl Quran as invalid, therefore I would never give them a voice or platform in any of my institutes. Now, some who follow a highly liberal understanding of knowledge say, no, no, everybody should have a chance. That's called a liberal arts university. That should be there. But what happens over there is the classical perspective never gets a chance. All right? Uh, but that said, you, any, whoever asks this question is more than uh, welcome to take. You will be given this presentation. You take that PDF I made, and it's all Quran. And if you want to go listen to what their view is on these verses, you can take it to them and you can ask them. It's your wish. Right? Everybody makes a decision how far you want to explore. Right? So when you take this to the extreme, uh, some university students like to ask this question also, well, look, how can I be in Islam when I haven't investigated Buddhism? I haven't investigated Hinduism. I haven't invested in Shintoism. I haven't invested in Confu Confucianism. At the level of which you presented Aditha, at that level, I haven't investigated Christianity. I haven't invested in Judaism. So your lifetime is not enough to do all of these things. Right? And you might die tomorrow also. And you're going to be judged on the Day of Judgment. So this notion that I have to listen and hear and understand every single thing before I decide is not practicable. That said, if you want to do that, it's your choice. It's your choice. If you want to decide whether you accept a deed only until you hear the Ahl Quran argument, that's your choice. But I will never facilitate that for you because I do not facilitate invalid presentations of deen. You should be very careful. Do not present yourself to hear falsehood because there's something called shaitan and there's waspas of shaitan. This I will tell you openly. You sit in front of the people of falsehood. You will be opening your heart. You will be thinking you're opening up your mind to them. So there's no point in going without an open mind, right? I think that anybody, can, even the questioner, would understand. There's no point in going to, with a closed mind. It's a waste of the Ahl Quran's person time. It's a waste of your time. The only sense you would go is if you went with an open mind. When you go with an open mind, you've opened your mind to the waspas of shaitan also. All right? And I am also, I, I'm saying this answer very strongly because I strongly view this as a misconception. And I've seen people go astray. And again, I have no shyness on this. How far in the study of Hadith must an ordinary Muslim go in order to become a confident Muslim? Basically, I would say you have to go as far as required for you to get certainty in your understanding of the Sunnah of Nabi Akrim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if a person says, I'm willing to trust the Muhaddithin, then you can pick up Riyadh al-Salihin. If you say, no, before I trust Muhaddithin, I need to learn all that stuff that you showed, then you better bring me four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years of your life, and we'll enroll you in some institution, and you get busy. <laughs> There's no problem there. You can do it if you want. But this wish that give me a quick way to do it. I would even do that if I could, but there's no way. Can you go to the doctors and say, look, you know, I don't trust you, so can you give me a one-month course so in medicine? They say, no, you do five-year MBBS or you fill this prescription. We can't do it for you. I say, okay, about six-month course. I can't do it for you. How about a two-year course? I can't do it for you. Okay, just drop it by one year. Give me a four-year MBBS course. I'm willing, but I can't take more than, I've saved enough money for four years of study so I'm going to stop my business and study for, say we can't do it for you, five years or nothing. That's what they, so why can't I be the same way with you? All right. That question we'll do after when we come back this room, inshallah.